I would like really very much to welcome you, Paul Harris. Thank you very much for being with us. And I brought this book because there is a quote in it from your friend and researcher, Alison. Um, and we spoke today at lunch and I asked you many, maybe a bit stupid questions from a person who is not a developmental psychologist, but very much interested in. Um, and for to bring as well a bit the connections, we, Gerd and myself, we read this book from Alison Gopnik uh, on the, philo the philosopher, the baby philosopher. And there is a quote, and I will read it in German. And uh, you know that quote? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, she writes, Der englische Psychologe Paul Harris weiß wahrscheinlich mehr über das Vorstellungsvermögen von Kleinkindern als irgendjemand sonst. Harris arbeitete viele Jahre lang in Oxford, ist schlank, zurückhaltend und very British. Seine Arbeit ist genau wie das Werk von Oxfords berühmtesten Schriftsteller Lewis Carroll, eine typisch englische Mischung, strengste Logik angewendet auf die wildesten Fantasien. So, thank you for this introduction. Actually, um, as I mentioned to Carmen over lunch, Alison Gopnik is an old friend of mine, and so I was actually reading the manuscript for this book with this little description of me, and I think she, in the English version she uses the word Tweedy. Tweedy, I don't know what the German word is for Tweedy, it's a kind of rather heavy cloth that British academics use, but it, it sort of implies you're a little bit dull. So anyway, I... I then met Alison on an airplane. We were going to the same meeting. And I said to her, look, I'm not sure about this description of me as Tweedy. And she just grabbed my jacket. And she said, look, you are wearing a Tweed jacket. So she, I couldn't deny it at that point. OK, so you can see my title is Trusting What You're Told, How Children Learn From Others. And this is the title of my own recent book, which is uh, an attempt to bring together about 10 years of research looking at the extent to which children learn essentially from other people rather than from their own explorations and observations. And to some extent, I'm working against um, a much stronger tradition in philosophy and in psychology, perhaps initiated in part by this young man, um, you may recognize, despite the hairstyle, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Let me give you a typical quote of his in thinking about children's intellectual development. So this is from um, his famous book on education, Emile. To nourish his curiosity, that's Emile's curiosity, never hasten to satisfy it. Let him not know anything because you have told him but rather because he has understood it for himself. So this is a very strong early statement of the, the sort of constructivist philosophy that some people adopt with respect to children. The idea is that they are self-starters, they should go and observe for themselves. And if anything, if they ask you a question, you should postpone answering the question. You should let the child figure it out for themselves. Of course, Jean uh, Rousseau was uh, Swiss uh, from Geneva, and you might recognize here a portrait of his countryman, um, Piaget, who I would argue was deeply influenced by this Rousseauian uh, philosophy, and if anything, translated it into a research program emphasizing that children not only figure things out for themselves, but to some extent resist um, insights and correction from adults. I was lucky enough many years ago when I was writing my doctorate to spend a few weeks in Geneva and I went along to listen to some of Piaget's lectures and I still remember this vignette he told about one of his daughters, I believe it was uh, Lucien. So Lucien was with her father, Piaget, and she had been turning around and around and uh, in doing that, she became dizzy. So she turned to her father and she said, Papa, is it spinning around you too? And 
Piaget explained in the lecture that um, he said to his daughter, what do you think? A typical Rousseau response. And she apparently stamped her foot and said, you always ask me that. So this sums up the fact that Piaget, not only in his psychology, but perhaps in his parenting, was inclined to adopt this stance to expect children to figure things out for themselves. So let me tell you what my research suggests, which I think is somewhat different. And it begins, to some extent, with children's pretend play. Then I'll talk a little bit about the development of trust in what other people tell them. I typically use this word testimony, so testimony refers to a claim about something that's not necessarily been observed by the listener, but the listener hears about this testimony with respect to an event that they didn't witness and tends to place some trust in what they're told. Then I'll turn to children's questions and finally to the extent to which children defer to other people, especially to adults. So let me show you a short clip of a piece of uh, pretend uh, play. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten spoonfuls. Okay. Taste. I'll use my hand. Mmm, it's tasting now. Can I try? <laughs> I always like it when he says, let's do it again. So, uh, that, even though it's rather brief, that is actually quite a rich um, episode uh, in the sense that if you noticed, the child was thinking of some invisible substance and using the spoon to transfer it to the pot held by his father, the child perfectly understood when all the ingredients were mixed up and this empty pot is tilted toward the child and the child uh, reaches in and tastes this imaginary food. So what's clear from this example is that the child brings to bear on this little imaginative world, this world in which this invisible meal is being cooked, all sorts of naive, or not naive, but as it were, everyday assumptions about the way the world works. So that this invisible substance, if you pick it up in a spoon and move the spoon, well, the invisible substance will move in the spoon and end up in the pot. So in other words, the child's understanding of causality applies also to the imaginary world. And we looked at this um, in the following experiment. We had two different groups of children. One child might watch as the experimenter took a milk carton and would pour from the milk carton into a, an empty con into a container. So the milk carton, of course, is empty. This is just pretend. And then this container was carried over to a toy horse and the container is turned upside down as the child watches. On the other hand, you can see on the right-hand side uh, a slightly different scenario. This time we take a can of talcum powder, shake it into the container, bring it over to the toy horse, turn the container upside down. And now we can turn to the children, no matter whether they've seen um, the milk carton or the talcum powder, and we can ask them about what's happened to the horse. And if you think about it, the horse has suffered in both, uh, in both episodes, but the outcome for the horse is different. So if you ask children what's happened to the horse, the first group say he's all wet, milky, got milk on, covered in milk. The other group, on the other hand, say that he's dry, powdery, got powder on him, covered in powder. Now, all of this, of course, is based on the child's rich imagination. They're working out the consequences of what you did in either transferring milk or in transferring the powder. And then they realize that this substance, be it milk or powder, will be carried over to the toy horse. And when you invert this container, substances are attracted by gravity and they fall on the surface underneath. 
So if you really unpack this, you can see that it requires a lot of thinking on the part of the child, even though it flows very easily and we take it for granted when the child gives, at two years of age, the kinds of answers that I've listed here. So I did a lot of work on children's imagination, but toward the end of that program of research, when I wrote it up in a book called The Work of the Imagination, I began to think about the connection between imagination and language. In particular, the idea that the child could listen to somebody's statement about something that they didn't see happen, make in their imagination a mental picture, a visual picture of what had been asserted by someone, and then they could apply this imaginative picture to the actual world and take it to be a description of the truth about the actual world. Now that sounds rather complicated, but in the experiment I'm going to show you now, I think it becomes clear what I'm driving at. So we uh, introduce children uh, to this room. As you can see, there are four different locations, the pillow, the bag, the box, the chair. And the child might be invited, for example, to play with a, a stuffed animal, that's a, a rabbit or a monkey, and perhaps um, place it, for example, in the box here. Then the child would be invited to this outer space and could, depending on the condition, the child could be lifted up and look back through the window into this area, or the child was not lifted up and couldn't see what happened. So what happened next was that an adult would go to this box, take the, the stuffed animal, let's say, and move it over here to the bag. And then the children would come um, back into the room, and the children who had seen this movement would, of course, be expected to go over here to retrieve the toy animal, the, the stuffed animal. On the other hand, the other group of children who hadn't seen what had happened, we told them. So the, the person who had moved it came to the child and said, I moved the animal from the box to the bag. And what we were interested in was whether the children who were merely told were as effective in changing their mind about the location of the object as the children who had seen what had happened. So here we have a simple, straightforward comparison between first-hand observation and testimony. Let's take a look at a 30-month-old, and you'll see that this 30-month-old um, does pretty well when she comes back. You'll see that she's been, she is, she's told that the, the animal has been moved from this box here over to this bag. And so the question is, where will she look when she comes back? Keep in mind that she put the animal here. She put the animal here. So the question is, will she go with what she saw or will she go with what she's told? Hey, Sophia, I found a better place. I moved the doggy from the box to the bag. Now the doggy's in the bag. Did you hear that? She moved the doggy from the box to the bag. Should we go find the doggy? <gasps> Did you find him? So, no problem. She takes in this information. She herself had put the doggy in the box, but she ignores the box and she goes to the bag. But now let's take a look at a child who's about seven months younger, and she's facing the same situation. Wait, 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 hold up. Hey, Rosalie, guess what? I put the monkey in the bag. Now the monkey's in the bag. Did you hear that, Rosalie? Jennifer put the monkey in the bag. Yeah. Did you find it? Yeah. Yeah! Okay, so you saw that with uh, this younger child, there's this oscillation. She comes back, and actually you may not see this very easily, but to even help her, there's a little window here. 
So not only has she been told that the, the uh, animal has been moved, uh, she can see that this is empty. But even with those um, hints, so to speak, she initially relies on her own first-hand observation. But then you notice that she's actually processed the, inf the linguistic information. She goes, to, she goes here, doesn't find the animal, and then she said, bag, as if reminding herself that there's this alternative option, and off she goes and eventually finds the animal. So if we plot the results of these experiments, so at 23 months, the children do very well if they've looked through the window, if they've managed to see the change, but if they're told about it, they don't do so well. By 30 months of age, that problem is resolved. Uh, testimony is as good as observation. So here we see an experimental demonstration of the emergence of trust in others. It's, of course, very pedestrian. It's only about the location of an object. But this, to my mind, is the beginning of an expansion of the child's universe because increasingly they're going to be told about not common or garden objects, but more complicated objects, germs, angels, God, vitamins, things that they don't necessarily easily see so let's take a look at that list. We have some scientific entities, germs and oxygen. We have some special beings, God and Santa Claus. And we also hear some creatures that children hear about, but probably um, will not be hearing about in the context of everyday conversation, but in the context of fairy stories. So we ask children about these various kinds of entity, and we asked a very simple question, namely, is there, is there such a thing as germs? Did, are there really germs in the world? Or is there such a person as Santa Claus? Is there really a Santa Claus? Are there really mermaids? And we uh, got an estimate, therefore, of the child's confidence in the existence of these various entities. Keep in mind, though, of course, that um, children don't ordinarily have first-hand encounters with germs or oxygen or God. I mean, conceivably, they see a fake Santa Claus in the shopping mall at Christmas time, um, but he's not, the, he's not the real thing. Here's what we found. So children are very confident about the existence of these scientific entities. They're fairly confident also about the existence of God, but... Um, make-believe fictional characters. These are five- and six-year-olds. Um, the children are less confident about. This, if you look at the graph, you can see that children are a little bit more confident about germs than God. There's actually a whole... I could spend the rest of the evening telling you about why that is. It's fascinating. Um, I mean, it, to, be, to be brief, it's not because children are, so to speak, more scientific than theological. Um, but at any rate, I won't go there, otherwise it'll, it'll, I shall get too excited about it. <laughs> okay. So we've taken the child from the age of two to the age of five, and by the age of five or six, the child's mental universe has expanded way beyond what the child can see. It includes these invisible su supernatural entities or spiritual entities. Uh, it, is, it also includes these invisible scientific entities. Now let's take a look at children's reflection on this hidden world. And one way to do that is to look at children's questions. And of course, of course children's questions are um, a nice index of children's willingness to think of other people as sources of information. So these, this is, of course, the very tendency which Rousseau and Piaget were somewhat nervous about satisfying. In a recent um, very interesting monograph by Michelle Chouinard, she looked at um, a group of children whose language had been studied between the ages of two and five. So the investigators would go along to the parent, to the child's home, every couple of weeks or so, and simply record the child's spontaneous language, typically in the company of a familiar uh, family member, uh, typically the mother. And 
Schwinar looked at these hundreds of thousands of utterances, I might say, to see how often, how frequently, the child asked a question. Now, imagine you're looking after a three-year-old. You're paying this three-year-old a fair amount of attention, you're an attentive, you've read about attachment theory, you know you should be responsive to this three-year-old. How many questions per minute do you think that three-year-old is going to ask you? Make a mental estimate. Well, here are the data. If Think about looking after Adam, that second child down over here. You're going to have to answer 198 questions per hour. Even these, even these children are asking you a question every minute or so. So you better be fresh, alert, have had your coffee. What do they ask? Well, they do ask questions which are not aimed at information. For example, some requests, will you close the door? Sometimes asking for clarification. But they do often ask for information. Some of these questions are in asking for factual information. Some are asking for how and why. As you can see, why is the baby crying? How come I can't go outside? So if we look at the data, so here we're looking at the data from 24 months all the way up to 59 months. And you can see in red the information-seeking questions occupy about two-thirds of the data. The other types of questions, permission, requests, and so forth, one-third. Now we'll take these red lines, these red bars, and split them up into basic facts versus explanations. And you'll see that if we look at the youngest children, they're mostly trying to get the facts. They don't ask many explanation questions, but by the time the child is two and a half, so the age of that older child that I just showed you in the clip, um, they're asking questions that seek explanation um, just over a fifth, sometimes about a quarter of the time. Now, if we do a little bit of arithmetic, let's imagine that a child spends a couple of hours in a dialogue with a caregiver every day. So we imagine that this child maybe spends a lot of time with peers in a preschool, but he or she also spends a couple of hours with a caregiver. Not um, an overly conservative assumption that the child will spend two hours per day with the caregiver. So if we use the averages that we have described in these four children, we can see that that child will ask 36,000 explanation-seeking questions during the preschool period. So, it's okay, if, possibly, for Rousseau and Piaget to say, don't, ask, don't answer children's questions, but you're, one's tempted to say from these data, you're ignoring an amazing opportunity uh, if you do so. Okay, now I want to switch gears slightly and uh, talk about children as a distinct species of primate. There's some fascinating work going on at the moment where experimenters are making a comparison between children and chimpanzees. Between children and chimpanzees. Now, of course, you can't expect chimpanzees to ask questions. But you can expect a chimpanzee to imitate. And indeed, there's been a lively research program looking at the extent to which children um, and chimpanzees do imitate a demonstration and the extent to which they are similar in the way that they imitate or whether they are different. Let's take a look at this um, clip uh, from a child um, Im who's about uh, three or four years of age and she's been uh, shown an apparatus um, 
you'll see the experimenter show her how to open the apparatus to get something f out of it, a toy or a sticker. But you'll see that the experimenter who demonstrates how to open the box um, is a little bit absurd in the sense that he does it in a very, very complicated way. He does things that are, you know, unnecessary. So let me show you the clip and you'll see what I mean. So now it's the child's turn. So you saw that the child, um, or the child observed the adult, for example, tap in the top before going eventually to this window and extracting the, the, uh, the sticker, I think it was. And the child does exactly the same. So this is typically called over-imitation. Over-imitation in the sense that the child adds in all these unnecessary elements. So now we can ask, what happens if you do the same thing with a chimpanzee? You show the chimpanzee such a box, you bang on the top, and eventually you get the treat. In the case of a chimpanzee, it's going to be a peanut rather than a sticker. And then you pass the apparatus to the chimpanzee, and they, the chimpanzee has a go. What you see in the chimpanzee is efficiency. They don't bother with all this fancy stuff about banging on the top. They just reach and get the peanut. So there's a sense in which you could say chimpanzees are smarter than children. I mean, they're not, they're not fooled by all this, these frills, these unnecessary elements. They get to the point and they get the object out of the box. But if you look at it from another perspective, it's clear that to some extent the, ch the child seems to be saying to him or herself, I'm not sure exactly what this situation includes. I'm not sure exactly what you are supposed to do here, but I will defer to the adult who's, imitate, who's shown me what to do. And I'll copy rather carefully and conscientiously that adult. If you leave the child to their own devices, you don't show them what to do. They're as efficient as the chimpanzee. So there's a sense in which the child is deferential. But if you think about human culture, it, of course, is important for children sometimes to be deferential. There's accumulated wisdom about opening boxes, about how to fish, about how to cook, about what is a medicine, and perhaps about um, the way to live more generally, which can be transmitted to children, provided they're prepared to concede that they may not know the best answer. And so there's a difference between the species in the sense that the chimpanzee tends to think that, if anything, they agree with Rousseau. The chimpanzee says, let me solve this for myself. The child says, maybe I should learn something from this adult, from this caregiver. So let me summarize some of my key points. Children come to treat testimony um, as true. We saw that with the child searching for the, the monkey or the stuffed animal in the correct location. That testimony, uh, by the age of 30 months, overrides in a very efficient way what they've seen firsthand Children by the age of five or six are treating other people as trustworthy informants about hidden reality. I gave you some examples of scientific entities. I gave you some examples of spiritual entities. Another example I didn't discuss, but which is fascinating, is human history. You can't take a child by the hand and show them human history. You can't show them 
um, the civil war in the United States or um, the adventures of seafarers. But you can tell them about those human endeavors. And there's a sense then in which, uh, again, when we move outside of science and religion, history too depends upon children learning from the testimony of other people. As we saw, children ask lots and lots of questions, and uh, they often use their questions to get at explanations, and explanations typically are aiming at that hidden reality, what you can't see for yourself, but somebody else can explain. They accept guidance even when it goes against their own judgment. As we saw with the box opening, the child could have used a more efficient strategy, but having seen the adult deferred to the adult and uh, went along with what the adult showed them to do. And this is a species difference. We're distinctive in this respect, and it allows us to build up culture over multiple generations, and it ensures that uh, knowledge accumulated in one generation can be transmitted to the next. So how would one summarize, then, my take on the child? Well, let me first contrast it with Rousseau and Piaget. So for them, the child is like a scientist, and for my good friend and colleague, Alison Gopnik, the child is a little bit like a scientist. Um, they learn best from their own direct experience, and they gradually construct um, more and more effective theories of the world, typically objective theories in the eyes of these, these um, investigators. So in these investigations, you don't see much discussion of history or religion, um, they focus more on the scientific. My view is different. I think that children are better thought of not as scientists, but as anthropologists. They're born into a culture, and they are very gifted in being what anthropologists call participant observers. They embed themselves in this culture, they learn the language, and they watch what is happening around them, and bit by bit, just like an anthropologist, they make sense of it, and in doing so, they depend on guidance and testimony from other people about what happened in that next door room, about hidden causal agents, and about, of course, what will happen in the future, which we'll be discussing a little bit more in the later part of this, uh, of this conference. Let me finish with one question which puzzles me, and I don't have a good answer to it, um, which is, how exactly do children think about their informants? So the child meets somebody who provides some information. So what attitude or conception of an informant, somebody who answers a question, does the child have? And there seem to be two different ways of um, thinking about this. On the one hand, the child might think of an informant as a wise prophet who bears witness to the truth. So here's Moses coming down from the mountain with the tablets. It's, it's actually not Moses, it's Charlton Heston, uh, but you, you see what I mean. So that would be one conception that the child might have. Or it's possible, though, that the child says to itself, no, I'm living in this particular culture, and what I really need to do is to figure out what the norms are. So I should think of um, my informants as respectable citizens who fit in with these norms. You can see these gentlemen in some uh, London uh, subway station dressed identically, fitting in with the norms. Now, I don't actually know myself exactly how children conceive of the information they're getting. Is the information the truth, or is the information in some sense regarded by them as what is accepted in their culture? And that's a question for the future. Let me stop there. Okay. <laughs>